Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to the third lecture of this course, Gender and Literature. So the first two lectures were spent introducing the subject. So the first lecture I talked about what is in this course, the content of this course. Then I briefly touched upon some of the uh, theoretical components of this course. And the second lecture was spent more specifically on looking at two theoretical concepts, performativity, then agency, and of course some other related topics which came off, uh, you know, along with these two terms. And then of course we looked at um, a Shakespeare text, Two of Night, where we saw how performativity, embodiment, agency, these play out in certain cultural conditions as represented in a literary text. So today what we'll do, we'll move on to the uh, first real text of this particular course. Uh, it's a text, it's a short story by Munshi Premcha, it's called The Chess Players, uh, which was subsequently made into a film by a short Rai called Shatran Shri now we'll look at the story as well as the uh, film as different texts because uh, there are some differences that we'll explore in terms of what happens in the story and in terms of what happens in the, in the film because there are some things which happen in the film which do not appear in the short story. But the main, the main, pro the main point, the, the, the real uh, content of this lecture today will be to look at the short story in details. Uh, so look at it as a text, we'll look at it through, uh, you know, in, in great details and especially in the way it plays out. Uh, the gender norms, the gender roles, the gender performances uh, through different orders of embodiment. So uh, having said that, uh, the other important thing to look at obviously is a historical context which produces text. Now this short story was written in 1924 by Prem Chan and this is the website from which we will read uh, the short story. So you can download it you can, and it's a very nice translation uh, from the uh, main uh, original Hindi a short story, it's been translated in English and this is a good translation I think. So we'll look at it uh, and this is the translation we'll follow. So as you can see the chess plays, the short story was written in 1924 but the setting of the short story is much earlier. It was the period uh, of Wajid Ali Shah when he was ruling Lucknow. So he ruled Lucknow for nine years as you know uh, from 1847 uh, to, um, to, to 1856. So just before the uh, Sipai rebellion. So this was a time when the British were really making inroads into India uh, and obviously you know, the East India Company uh, was getting more and more powerful. Uh, it had a military base, it had a strong economy base, so it was you know, basically the economic phase of imperialism where they were uh, obviously lending money to different kingdoms uh, and the kingdoms were becoming bankrupt because they could not return the money and in that process the company was taking over one kingdom after another kingdom. So the short story by Prem Jan, uh, it is set in that kind of a historical uh, epoch, at that, that point in history where the company was about to take over Lucknow uh, or Awadh, which was a kingdom that Wajid Ali Shah ruled. Now what is important in the short story and the reason why I have selected it as part of the scores is the way in which certain kinds of gender roles are played out, are performed, are embodied. But more importantly, how certain kinds of gender roles change. So what was hegemonic masculinity at the beginning of the short story becomes, I mean, it completely shifts away and becomes marginalized by the time the story ends. So by the t that time the story ends, we have a different kind of masculinity coming in, a different kind of gender roles coming in. So the story begins with a very feudal kind of masculinity, femininity, where the men are supposed to be the bread earners, uh, they're supposed to be uh, out there doing the jobs, whereas the women uh, are, you know, sort of cornered away in a little, you know, uh, the, the, the inter interior section of the house, and they are not allowed. They don't, in other words, they don't have any agency, uh, any economic agency, any 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 cultural agency, none whatsoever. So they are basically imprisoned. They they have a very uh, repressed kind of an embodiment, 
whereby they are completely at the mercy of the men. Uh, but importantly, what this particular short story does, it shows you the inadequacy of the men. So the men could not control the kingdom. I mean, we have a, uh, we have a ruler uh, who is uh, essentially emasculated by the British because he can't control the kingdom. Uh, and he's more of a poet ruler rather than a warrior ruler. And again, th that's the kind of masculinity we look at, you know, and how that shifts. Uh, so, you know, when, when the story opens, when we see Wajid Ali Shah, when we see, when we read the descriptions of Awad and Lucknow, we find it's, it's more concerned, it's more bothered with art and culture and poetry and all the, so the lyrical pursuits of life rather than looking after the economy uh, or the kingdom or the military. So these things are sidelined. Right. So the economy is in complete turmoil. You know, there is absolutely, you know, the entire kingdom is bankrupt. Uh, it has borrowed enormous amount of money from the East India Company. And now it finds itself in a position where it can't pay back the debt. And so as a result, the company is going to have an easy takeover. They're just going to come in and take it over. And importantly, there is ro no real battle. I mean, no battle is fought. So the ruler, as you'll see in the story, uh, instructs his uh, courtyards, instructs his uh, the army not to have any resistance, not to uh, create any resistance to the British. So basically the British just come in and take over the kingdom, right? Uh, so we have different kinds of masculinity, different kinds of femininity at, uh, at conflict with each other. Uh, you know, they, they really juxtapose with one another and we are supposed to compare and contrast the different kinds of gender roles, gender performances, gender embodiment. And the way embodiment plays out in this short story and more importantly in the film and we will look at certain images from the film as we move on in this uh, lecture. So there will be a couple of lectures on this. I will take two lectures to finish this short story. But if you look at the film, uh, the way Ray uh, makes people dress up, right? So there is a certain kind of sartorial culture, there is a certain kind of dressing culture which is followed by the Nawab and his courtiers in Lucknow, in Awad. And that kind of dressing culture is excessive is very ornamentated, is very embellished. Uh, so people are dressing up uh, in, you know, an enormous amount of jewelry has been put on. Whereas if we compare and contrast that to the way the British dress up, uh, the company officials dress up, it's very cut and dried, very utilitarian, very pragmatic. So even in the kind of the sartorial difference between the way, uh, the, between the two orders of embodiment, that is reflective of the two different orders of masculinity which has been portrayed in this particular short story. And of course, uh, you know, what is also interesting and we will look at it as we move on in this particular lecture is a very complex relationship between uh, gender and space. So the woman in this short story, they inhabit a certain, uh, certain kind of space, the interior space of the house. So the, the house, the one house, the one building uh, it, it is subdivided into different kinds of spaces. So there is this male space which is a public space where people sit play chess, meet one another, uh, that's a semi-public space. So people come from the outside, in other words, in, in that space. And that, that is where the meetings happen, that is where the discussions happen, that is where the chess playing happens in this particular short story. Whereas the woman, unfortunately, and this is a tragedy, this is, if you look at it from a feminist perspective, it's a very tragic situation for the woman. So the, the story clearly shows, and uh, so does the film, that the women are far more intelligent over here than the men. The men are just buried in their uh, leisurely pursuits, which includes, uh, you know, which include playing chess. I mean, they, they spend virtually the entire day playing chess and doing nothing. They're unproductive. They are completely unintelligent. Uh, so they spend the whole day playing chess and, you know, having other kinds of leisurely pursuits like flying kites, writing poetry, uh, you know, having, uh, you know, cockfights. Uh, gambling, uh, taking opium. So in other words, uh, they're very, very indulgent. It's a very indulgent kind of culture. It's a very uh, hedonistic kind of culture, which is completely unproductive. Whereas the woman, uh, who could have been, I mean, there are, there are very, very specific references to women, uh, and there are very clear indications that if women had the agency, they would have been much better administrators. If they had the agency, they would have been much better rulers, much better controllers of the kingdom. But they don't have any agency. It's that historical period of time where there is absolutely no agency given to the woman. And if, if you compare, if you remember uh, our previous lecture, when we read the Shakespeare play, Two of Night, uh, and we sort of talked about how uh, the reason, one of the reasons why Viola in Two of Night, after she suffers a shipwreck and loses, and she thinks she loses, she's lost her brother, uh, and she finds herself in a completely different kingdom, in order to attain agency, true embodiment, she dresses up as a man, right? Because that would give her a certain degree of protection, a certain degree of agency, financial, cultural, social, you know, mobility, 
uh, so everything will become different. In other words, uh, you know, we, we talked about, you know, we spent a lot of time in the last lecture talking about the relationship between embodiment and agency, especially as it plays out, these two terms play out uh, in gender studies. So, uh, the question of agency keeps coming back in this particular short story. The men have all the agency, but they do nothing. They just play chess uh, in a while away all the time, you know, being unproductive, leisurely, hedonistic, uh, narcissistic, uh, intoxicated, right? Whereas the women uh, who would have been much better rulers, who would have been much better administrators, find themselves completely imprisoned uh, in the interior space of the house. So, again, the space comes, um, you know, keeps coming back uh, as a very interesting trope in this short story especially in the way it, it defines gender. Uh, it, you know, it, helps in, it helps us today looking at the relationship in embodiment and gender uh, as these two categories play out in this particular short story. Now, uh, the other thing that we, I would like to spend some time with uh, in this particular lecture is the idea of hegemonic masculinity. Right? So, hegemonic masculinity is, is a very important term in gender studies. Hegemony, of course, is dominance. So, the dominant masculinity, uh, you know, uh, as we know by now, hopefully, we, you know, we, we, we agree on it by now because we spend quite a amount of time, uh, you know, talking about this. Hegemonic masculinity as a construct, like all constructs, is mutable and context specific. It depends on a series of material factors, including but not limited to economy, language, and political conditions. So, again, uh, we, we spent a lot of time in the last couple of lectures, uh, in the, in the introductory lectures of this course, uh, looking at the relationship between abstraction and materiality, right? So, and the difference, as we talked about, as we discussed, is not always very, very uh, defined. It's not a very defined difference, the difference between abstraction and materiality. And oftentimes, these two categories collide, uh, especially when we look at embodiment, gender, uh, and, and all these related uh, categories of, uh, of, of, of being. So, hegemonic masculinity is a construct. It's, it's constructed to certain rituals, practices, cultural codes, uh, and also some very specific material apparatus, uh, including, but not limited to, as I just showed you in the slide, uh, economy, language, and political conditions. In other words, uh, political conditions define hegemonic masculinity. Right? So, what kind of political condition is at play? What kind of political condition is really the subtext? That defines to a great extent what will become hegemonic in terms of masculinity, femininity and other gender roles. Likewise, economy. So, uh, in this particular short story, we have a very interesting uh, and very clear and complex economic shift. So, a shift which is being indicated over here is a shift from a very feudal kind of an economic system to a more capitalist kind of an economic system. So, in other words, the Nawab uh, and the entire Nawabi economy, which was prevalent before the British came in, in Awad and Lucknow, was very feudal. So, we had landowners, we had what we call Jagidars. So, the two protagonists in the play, uh, in the short story, sorry, uh, are Jagidars. They're landowners. They don't have to work for a living. They have some land. Uh, and which ensures they have some money coming in from those lands because there are certain farmers working on those lands. So whatever they produce, a certain percentage of it comes uh, to these two people, the protagonists, uh, Mirja and Meen. So in other words, they don't really have to work for a living. They don't really have to worry uh, about working for a living. Uh, and they're completely feudal uh, in their, not just in their in the economic system, which is prevalent, but also in the order of embodiment, the, the way they dress up, the lifestyle they lead. They're all very, very feudal. Uh, and what changes in the short story, in the course of the short story, is a shift from the feudal economy, from the feudal system of economy, to a capitalist system of economy, where the British East India Company takes over. Now, mind you, as I mentioned, this is a story set uh, between 1847 and uh, 1856. In other words, just a year before the, uh, the, 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 great, the great rebellion, uh, or what the British called the mutiny in 1857. Right? Now, uh, interestingly, as you all know, so we, we, we talk about the British ruling India for 200 years, but that, that statement is a, bit, uh, is a bit complex. The British did not rule India for 200 years. It was a company rule for the first 100 years. Right? It wasn't a sovereign rule. Right? And as we know, the Queen took over only after the 1857 rebellion. Right? It's only after the rebellion was uh, crashed. Uh, and crushed and quenched that the, the queen decided to take over from the company. And prior to that, it was a company rule. So, this particular st short story, uh, The Chess Players, is about the East India Company coming and taking over the kingdom of Awad, right, or Lucknow, which was the capital. Now, 
The moment I say East India Company, I mean, we all know, those of you who are interested in the history of economy, the history of, uh, you know, uh, company, it was one of the first uh, multinational companies in the history of uh, no, Europe, for the matter. So, you know, it was a company which went out, branched out, had different offices across the globe, uh, and it was the beginning of imperialism. Now, if you look at, uh, and this is a bit of a digression, but hopefully it will help you understand the context uh, of this particular short story. If you look at any history of imperialism, you find in most occasions you have the three M's uh, which follow a chronological order M. So the first M is a merchant. Uh, the merchant who comes over or the merchants who come over, the mercantile system which comes over and takes over gradually the economic system. So they begin to invest in the market, they begin to buy into the market, uh, they begin to lend money in the market. Uh, in the process, they begin to have certain kind of presence, which quickly becomes dominance. Because if, you know, if you're lending money uh, to all those kingdoms, if you're lending money to the other local people, and they can't pay you back, uh, that's a very easy way uh, to dominate. Because you, you're essentially buying off their shares, you're essentially buying off their land, etc. So the first M is the mercantile system, the mercantile order, the, mili uh, you know, the, the merchant. The second M is the military. Right? So, the second M which comes over in order to protect the mercantile uh, economy system because a certain kind of economy is being produced and the moment we have an economy produced, an excess economy produced and the moment someone starts making a profit, the profit needs to be protected. Right? So, the protection for the protection we have the second M which is the military. The military order comes in. Right? And so, you know, the military comes in with uh, a certain uh, culture of coercion, a certain culture of control, a certain culture of, uh, you know, dominance, uh, physical corporeal dominance. Now, the third M which comes over is a missionary. Because, you know, the missionary comes in with another order of control which doesn't require military so much, which doesn't require coercion so much. Uh, it starts producing an order of control which is a control by consent. Right? So, the missionary starts, you know, you know, this economy of consent where people are happy to be controlled, where people are happy to be ruled by what they think is a superior order of civilization, a superior order of religion, a superior order of faith. So, you know, the three M's uh, hold true in almost any history of imperialism, uh, the merchant, uh, the military and the missionary. Okay? Now, what we have, uh, this particular short story, it's the first M. Right, the first M, which is you know bringing in the second M. So it is more of a, a mercantile kind of a system, whereby we have our company lending out money to various kingdoms, uh, and of course when the kingdoms can't pay back the money because they're too busy in leisurely pursuits, too busy in hedonistic activities, and because they're too busy with those things, you know the, the, the entire economy system is completely corrupt and, and, and crashing, uh, so they can't pay back the enormous amount of money they had borrowed from the company. So, the company comes and takes over, in other words, the kingdom. And of course, the, the, the process of taking over involves the military. So, the military, the second M is also present uh, in this short story, especially if you watch the film uh, and we'll look at certain slides from the film or maybe you know, certain images from the film and we'll see how clearly we have an army marching in at the end of the film with the purpose of taking over the kingdom. Okay? So, having given you this, this you know, the, the context, having hopefully given you uh, a certain idea of the context which produces short story, let's dive in uh, and see what really happens in the short story. So, what is the story about? Uh, now, I have a few slides, I have a few images which I would like to play out and this is obviously an image from the film uh, and this is an example of what I just mentioned uh, of the sartorial and embodied representations of masculinity. Now, if you look at the contrast in a way the two, the two kinds of sartorial cultures uh, appear over here. So, on your, on your left, I am not sure which way you are looking. So, uh, we have a group of courtiers uh, who obviously represent the Nawabi kind of masculinity, the Nawabi kind of gender uh, politics. Uh, and if you look at the way they are dressing up, it is excessive, embellished, uh, it is not something which will make you mobile, it is not something which will make you quick uh, or swift, uh, it is something more leisurely and laid back uh, and uh, you know essentially ornamentative. It is, it is sort of quite excessive, you know, they are wearing more dresses than they need to. And obviously, if you look at the Nawab, uh, who has been played by Amjad Khan away uh, in the film, uh, uh, he is dressed up in jewels, is decked up in jewels, is wearing a crown and all that uh, sort of comes together and making this into a very embellished, excessive kind of sartorial culture. Now, this uh, and the reason why I am spending some time looking at this uh, kind of culture, looking at this kind of representation is, uh, you know, this 
reflects, this is reflective of the economy, this is reflective of the gender politics, this is reflective of the, uh, the kind of lifestyle they were living at that point of time, excessive, embellished, ornamentative, uh, and essentially, uh, you know, not, not really productive or pragmatic or quick. Now, if we compare that to the way the British are dressed up, so if you look at the uh, other end, the other side uh, of your uh, of the screen, so you have three British officers sitting down, and what Ray uh, Shapir Ray does very, you know, adeptly, and is a brilliant filmmaker, obviously, is the fact that you know the, the contrast in the two sartorial cultures is so evident. So the British are dressed up uh, in a much more pragmatic way; uh, it's more cut, uh, it's more you know tailored cut, uh, you know, it's more you know lean, crisp, uh, not excessive. In other words, it's a kind of dressing culture, it's a kind of sartorial culture which will make you more mobile, which will make you more sort of productive and swift and quick and mobile. And this, uh, the reason why I'm playing this on screen is to give you an idea of the two different orders of masculinity in dialogue with each other over here. And obviously, as you see in the short story and also in the film, uh, you know, the British order of masculinity, the capitalist company order of masculinity uh, is essentially taking over, will take over in the course of the short story, uh, the other kind of masculinity, it's more feudal, uh, more hedonistic, more pleasure loving, more excessive, ornamentative, etc., embellished. So, you know, this is the kind of culture which is at play in, um, in uh, the chess players, or Shatan uh, you know, as a film is called. So, we have two different orders of masculinity in conflict with each other. We, we have a certain, uh, you know, we have the woman condition over here, which is very tragic uh, because the woman appear in the, in the film as well as a short story uh, as more assertive, more vocal, more intelligent. They have much better control uh, over the entire system. So, if, if they were administrators, the kingdom would be much better off. But obviously, they have no political agency, they have no financial agency. They can't, I mean, uh, you know, this is a time where women could not own any property. A woman could not have any kind of agency or any kind of liberty to move out. So, no mobility is given to the woman. So, the woman is confined, in other words, to the interiority of the house, to the interior space of the house. They can't really come out. I mean, forget about public space. They can't even come out in a semi-public semi space inside the house, the divan khana, where people come, meet, discuss. The women are not allowed to enter that space. So, all the space that is allowed to them is the interior space, the andamal. So, the inside where you know they, they are locked up essentially without any kind of agency whatsoever okay now uh, the other i mean i'm just giving you these slides just to emphasize the point that i'm making uh, the the contrasting images of masculinity so we have on one side we have the nawab uh, and if you look at the way he's dressed up uh, it's sort of sentimental excessive uh, it's something very embellished and ornamentative. In other words, not really uh, some, something or someone you associate with productivity or quickness or military strength or pragmatic reason. I mean, these things are not really uh, portrayed in the way he's dressed up. So, what, the way he's dressed up and the way he's looking, obviously, this is very good acting. Uh, and Ray is obviously instructing the actors uh, to you know, have to wear that kind of a look. So, not only are they wearing uh, a certain kind of dress, they're wearing a certain kind of sentiment. Right? And the sentiment is obviously very, very uh, hedonistic, uh, you know, it's lyrical, poetic, uh, sentimental, not really very productive or pragmatic. In other words, not really what we would now consider stereotypically masculinist. Right? And if you contrast that to the other person in, 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 the, in, the, in the screen over here, uh, on the screen over here, you find he's dressed up in a much more uh, sort of office like position. So he's wearing a, a coat. And uh, on this table, we have a quill, uh, which has probably been used, presumably used to write uh, letters. There is a little cannon, which you can see on the screen as well. Uh, and everything uh, on the table has a certain kind of purpose. And even if it's ornamentative like the cannon, uh, it has a certain kind of military significance. In other words, it is more what we now call, uh, quote unquote, masculinist uh, in that sense. Right? So, because uh, again, this, this brings us back to the point that we've been discussing for the last uh, 10 minutes or so, the different cultures of masculinity at play with one another over here. That is very, very evident, that is spectacularly evident. Right? And Ray in the film makes it even more clear where, in the way he makes people dress up. So, we have the Nawabi feudal kind of dressing up, which is excessive and ornamentative and not very pragmatic and swift. And we have the company way of dressing up. Uh, which is more uh, pragmatic, uh, military, uh, it'll, uh, it'll appear more masculinist. Uh, and if you look at the desk over here, the, the things, the objects on the desk, uh, they obviously, uh, you know, they are used to write letters, and they are used to signify some kind of military strength, they are used 
uh, to signify uh, productivity, expansion. Whereas the other kind of dress system that the person is wearing, the, the Nawabi kind of dress system, uh, is not really related uh, to expansion. It's, it's more uh, you know, sentimental and excessive uh, and not really something which will uh, you know, associate with productivity, manly productivity. So, you know, this is a, a very fine short story which uh, through the different uh, kind of apparatus, the material apparatus, the cultural apparatus, the abstract apparatus, so all these apparatus combine together uh, to very clearly signify the difference between these two kinds of cultures. So, these two kinds of sartorial cultures, these two kinds of uh, administrative cultures, these two kinds of gender cultures, uh, etc. Right? So, this is a short story which is a really fertile um, text to look at, especially if you look in the relationship between literature and gender. And of course, uh, it has been made into a film as well, which makes it even more complex because then it translates into another medium of representation, which is cinema. Now, uh, so just to give you uh, a, a, a sort of a lowdown uh, of what we have been talking about for the last 10 minutes. So, we have the two different kinds of uh, orders of masculinity at play over here. So, on one side, we have the feudal, hedonistic, poetic, unproductive and excessive order of masculinity. So, which is you know, quite clearly represented the way the people are dressing, the way the people are talking in the film, the way the people are uh, embodying themselves in a short story. So, all they do in the short story is they play chess with one another and they write letters, they write lyrics, they, they sing songs, uh, they have kite fights, uh, they have you know, the gamble, uh, they take different kinds of opium. So, it is very hedonistic, it is very pleasure loving. So, the word hedonistic comes from hedonism which is pleasure, the love for pleasure. It is very feudal, uh, no one has to work, uh, the rich people just get money because there are poor farmers working for them uh, and they get a certain percentage of the produce, uh, they get a certain percentage of the money. Uh, so, don't, they do not really have to worry about earning a living uh, or doing something really you know, worthwhile in order to you know, sustain themselves. The money comes in from somewhere, but obviously that is drying up, that is coming to an end because it is a very corrupt kind of culture, it is a very pleasure loving kind of culture which does not really have a reasonable idea of its own necessities. It is excessive, it is unproductive and if you contrast that to the other side uh, you know, which is the East India Company kind of masculinity and that is more capitalist, more uh, utilitarian, more pragmatic, more productive and more essentially necessity driven. It is very goal oriented. It's it's out there to produce something. It's out there to gain something, to acquire something. Uh, in a certain objects, certain kingdoms, certain kinds of money, certain kinds of economy. In other words, it is something which is sort of designed uh, to be productive, designed uh, to be pragmatic, to be utilitarian and capitalist. So you know, it's um, what's interesting to see uh, over here. If you look at it, uh, even uh, take a cursory look at this particular slide, is how um, things like economy, language, dress, these come together. Right, so the, these 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 sort of material apparatus come together uh, to produce uh, the abstract idea of masculinity. So we have feudal capitalists, which is the economic order, the very real material economic order. We have poetic pragmatic, which is the order of language. Again, a very real, uh, you know, something we use all the time. Uh, we have the excessive and necessity driven, which is the order of the dress, the sartorial order, the difference between the two kinds of sartorial culture. So, again, so all these uh, very material, real things like dress, language, economy, all these combine together to, to produce this abstract apparatus of masculinity, this abstract idea of masculinity, right. And this is something I, I will keep saying throughout this course. I have said it already many times, and I will keep saying uh, as we move on, you know, take each text as it comes. Um, this very interesting interface between the abstract and the material because gender inhabits this interface between what really is there, what you can touch and feel and what is objectified and objectifiable and what is sort of abstract and um, happens to the level of ideas, right. So, the notion of gender, the idea of gender is a combination of these two categories of knowledge, the abstract category of knowledge and the material category of knowledge, the object, the objectifiable category of knowledge and the non-objectifiable category of knowledge. So, the word culture as I mentioned at some point uh, previously uh, is a very loaded term because it is a very dual kind of a thing. Uh, it sort of mixes this entire idea of economy, language, dress, food, etc., which are very real things, which are things which we know and, and can objectify, etc. Uh, but also, and equally, it is also, it has a component which is quite ideational. There is an idea component to culture. 
uh, which you can't really put a finger on, which you can't really objectify. So it's a combination of these two categories of knowledge, categories of being, two, two, these two states of being, in other words. Now, uh, so what I'll do is, uh, I will now look at uh, this, this particular short story in some detail and you know, you don't have to read it entirely. I'm just giving you the opening of the short story as it appears. But what is very evident in the opening, clearly, I mean the moment you start reading the short story is this is a kingdom which is absolutely absorbed in hedonism and pleasure and love for pleasure, right. This is absolutely absorbed in, in, in a pursuit of pleasure. So, it is not really a productive kingdom uh, either economically or culturally. I mean it is culturally productive in as much as it produces poetry and lyric and has different kinds of pleasure activities, but it is not really a strong military masculinist kind of culture. Right? It, it's, it doesn't have a strong military base, it doesn't have a strong economy base which makes it so easy for the British to come and take it over like a piece of cake really. So, if you, if you watch the film in the end of the film, you find the British army just coming in, just marching in and taking the Nawab away without any resistance whatsoever on the part of the Nawab. So, this is a kingdom which is not really masculinist uh, in an imperial sense. It is a kingdom which is self absorbed, it is a kingdom which is narcissistic, it is a kingdom which is pleasure loving and hedonistic. Uh, it is something you know everyone has uh, a certain kind of idea of pleasure and there is a section in the opening where uh, it is clearly described that if, if a beggar gets some kind of money uh, by begging, uh, he would spend it not by on buying bread, but on buying opium. So, in other words, it is a very decadent kind of culture. It is a culture, uh, it is a civilization which has reached a zenith and now the only way forward is downwards, right. So, it is something uh, for instance, when we talk about when we have this very apocryphal uh, mythical sort of semi mythical uh, uh, descriptions of Rome, when Rome was becoming decadent, when we have this gladiator fight, so people are coming and paying money uh, to see men being eaten alive by lions uh, and you know. Is, is a culture steep in pleasure and pursuit and all the rest of it. Uh, and then uh, this very, very uh, iconic image of Nero uh, playing the fiddle when Rome was burning. You know, no one knows how true that is, but you know, even if it is not true, that is reflective of the kind of culture which Rome had become. It is very decadent, self absorbed, uh, you know, not really productive anymore, not really expansionist anymore, not really masculinist anymore. Whereas, if you look at the British away at the Eastern Company is ruthlessly and mercilessly mercenary, right. It is completely clinically capitalist, it is sort of marching in, it is going to buy everything and it is just going to not, it is not going to stop anywhere until it buys it. It is very you know goal oriented as I just showed you in the previous slide, it is very productive, it is something which is completely designed to produce. So, it is more like a machine really. Uh, and obviously, uh, this is a time, this is the kind of culture which produces racism. Uh, or in other words, the very quote unquote uh, pseudo scientific systematic study of the difference between races. So, uh, you know, imperialism obviously, um, the birth of imperialism and the birth of racism uh, are almost simultaneous uh, to, a, to a great extent. So, when we have the white man behaving in a particular way, so uh, all these lovely attributes such as reason, logic, uh, pragmatic uh, productivity, these are ascribed to the white man. And obviously, the contrast to that, the, 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 the cultural contrast to that is the, uh, the oriental man or the African man uh, who is just the opposite of that. Uh, you know, so, you know, and obviously, those of you who have read uh, colonialism and post colonialism would may have read Edward Said's Orientalism, where he had argued brilliantly how the Orient was uh, an, a fantasy which is created by Europe or the Western civilization just to make, make them feel superior and compared to the, uh, the other kinds of culture. Right? But this particular short story is a very real short story which tells you the economic division, uh, the cultural division, uh, the pragmatic, the, the sartorial division, the gender division uh, between the, these two kinds of cultures. So, the, uh, the, the, the you know, avert kind of masculinity, the avert kind of gender uh, you know, mapping, the avert kind of sartorial culture, the avert kind of uh, you know, language, linguistic culture is completely different discursively different, completely different, fundamentally different from the, uh, the company kind of masculinity, the company kind of culture, the company kind of economy, the company kind of dressing up system, sartorial system, right. So, the opening of the short story if you read it uh, and this is from the blog, this is from the website I mentioned at the beginning of this code. So, uh, if you just go back uh, to this, uh, yeah, so this is a link you need to look at in order to follow uh, the different uh, sections which I am playing out on the screen for you now. 
So, uh, if you look at the opening of the short story, and I'll just read out certain sections, you know, uh, you, know you can read it at your leisure uh, later on. So, Lucknow was drowned in sensuality, the big and small, the rich and the poor, all were sunk in it. Some were engrossed in dance and music, some just reveled in the drowsiness induced by opium. Love of pleasure dominated every aspect of life. In administration, in literature, in social life, in arts and crafts, in business and industry, in cuisine and custom, everywhere sensuality ruled over. So the state officials were absorbed in fun and frolic, the poets in descriptions of love and a pain of separation, the artisans in zari and chicken work, uh, the businessmen in dealing with in coal, perfumes and cosmetics. All eyes were drowned in sensuality. No one knew what was happening around the world. And you know, and, and you go on and then uh, you know, there's a description where it's, it is mentioned that so much so that if a beggar had money, he preferred to spend it on opium or, or its extract than bread. Okay? So playing games like chess or cards or gazifa sharpens the mind, improves the mental faculties and helps to solve complex problems. Such arguments were being forcefully advanced. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is a culture which plays games, you know, games. This is a culture which is drowned in opium. This is a culture which is intoxicated, uh, you know, completely narcissistic. Uh, you know, it's completely disconnected from the realities of life. Uh, and what is very evidently described by the author over here is that this is a culture which is completely self-absorbed. It doesn't feel the need to look out. It doesn't feel the need to connect to what is outside it which is the complete opposite, the ontological opposite of imperialism because the entire idea of imperialism is to go out, reach out and connect to other cultures with obviously the purpose of you know, you know, getting into those cultures and dominating those cultures economically and then subsequently exploiting those cultures. So, imperialism as an enterprise is an expansionist enterprise. It wants to expand, it wants to move out, it wants to get into other kinds of cultures and you know, get into those cultures and then subsequently dominate and exploit those cultures. Whereas the kind of culture described here uh, in Lucknow is a completely self-absorbed inward looking culture uh, which is more bothered with poetry and gambling and different kinds of drugs, different kinds of games including chess. So, in other words, it is not connected to anything outside of itself. Right? So, this is a brand of masculinity, this is a kind of masculinity which appears in the chess players, in Shatan Shikhilari. Right? And this obviously produces its own demise, this obviously produces its own degeneration. So, that's why I use the word decadence uh, a, a short while ago when mentioning this kind of culture. It's a very really decadent kind of culture, uh, it's completely self absorbed. Now, obviously, uh, as you can understand, uh, the condition of the woman in this kind of culture would be quite tragic. Right? So, as I mentioned, this is a historical time when women had no financial agency, no political agency, none whatsoever. Uh, so, uh, you know, everything was quite tragic and bleak and they were confined to the interiors of the house and, and worse, the men folk who were supposed to quote unquote rule the kingdom, uh, look after the public things, you know, produce uh, wonderful things and be productive, they are themselves decadent. They are themselves completely non-productive, non-realistic, hedonistic and you know just couldn't be bothered less about what's happening around them. So, this is kind of a very easy picking for the company. They just come in, they in the company and take it over without any resistance. There is zero resistance on the part of the Nawab, no military resistance whatsoever. They had borrowed enormous amount of money from the company but there is no effort made to pay the money back. So, all the money that has been borrowed has been spent, wasted uh, on different kinds of hedonistic pursuits and that is what this, this short story is all about. This entire idea of hedonism, the hedonistic masculinity and what does it do to the gender definitions, what does it do to the gender map. So, that kind of uh, sort of hegemonic hedonistic masculinity will very quickly be replaced uh, by the company capitalist masculinity. Right? So, the gender map will change very, very quickly in this short story and we find uh, in the short story as in the film, the woman coming over, uh, they want to take over agency but they are completely helpless, they do not really have any agency. That is what makes it such a, such a sad short story if you look at it from uh, you know, a feminist perspective or just a general gender perspective because the men are useless in the short story. Uh, they, they spend all the time writing lyrics and playing chess and you know smoking opium uh, and not really being productive or pragmatic or useful uh, in any sense of the word and they can't even take care of their own family let alone the kingdom. The women are very dissatisfied, the women are very saddened, they are depressed, they want to come out of the interiority of the house but they cannot come out because that agency is not given to them. 
at, the, at this historical point of time, right? So, the second image, the, the, other, the next image that I'll play to you, and this is again from the film, is to look at, and this is very, very crucial, so please pay attention to this, the difference between biology and gender. So we talked a great deal in the previous lecture, especially when we, when we talked about two night, which is a very, sort of funny example of the difference between biological identity and gender identity. And we talked about how gender, uh, you know, it, it is sort of determined by biology to a great extent, but not completely. So your gendered identity may be different from a biological identity. It, it doesn't have to be completely aligned to the biological identity. Now the biology, it, it, it informs gender to a certain extent, but it does not over determine gender. It does not completely control your gender identity. So, the gender identity can be potentially different from your biological identity. And of course, 2 f is all about that, is not it? So, 2 f has a woman dressing up as a man, uh, performing a man's role, uh, embodying a man's role and in the process becoming, you know, a different kind of gender identity, which is completely different from a biological identity because she's a woman and she becomes a man called Cesario and then various complications follow as we had discussed in a previous lecture. Now, if we look at this particular image over here, so we have two different kinds of images. So, we have this man very, very, uh, you know, ornamentatively dressed. Uh, excessively dressed as you can see uh, sitting on his bed uh, you know with a, with a chessboard in front of him and there is a pawn box in front of him as well uh, and then of course he's you know is overweight uh, it looks quite shabby it doesn't look impressive at all uh, he doesn't look like what we would now in today's world in today's parlance consider as a rational productive man it doesn't look like it at all he doesn't give you that image at all uh, or that, that appearance at all. The appearance over here is completely uh, unproductive and lazy and indolent and hedonistic uh, and pleasure loving. Right? So, he is a man who sits on his bed, uh, you know, and this is obviously a uh, Divan Kana, uh, where uh, men from outside come as well uh, and meetings happen. But it, it, the only meeting that happens is between two men who are out there to play chess, and that is all the due throughout the day. Now, if you contrast that to the other image over here, which is a man, woman smoking hookah. Right. This is Shabada Hajmi, of course, and that's Sanjeev Kumar. Uh, and these are uh, images, uh, stills from the film, Shatan Shakilari by Shatan Rai. Now, again, if you look at the, the, the woman over here, she looks much more masculine, doesn't she? So, the gendered identity of the woman is much more masculine, much more purposeful, uh, much more goal-oriented. She looks someone uh, who has more intelligence, uh, someone who is more reasonable, someone who is more calculative, someone who is more uh, sort of ambitious and, and pragmatic. Uh, and there is a certain section of, there is a certain degree of symmetry about her. So, the pipe, the hookah pipe that she is smoking is very, very phallic, right? Uh, it is like the, the, the male symbolic uh, uh, object to a great extent. And if you look at, if you contrast that to the very shabby spread out um, uh, you know objects in front of the man over here, the biological man over here, that is not masculine at all. He is very shabbily dressed, he is overweight, he is excessive, everything about him is excessive, the dress is excessive, uh, the objects are excessive uh, and it is, it is company, it is completely sorry, it is completely an economy of excess. That is why I use the word excessive so frequently. But if you look at the woman over here, uh, she is not excessive. I mean, despite being a woman, she is wearing some ornaments, but then uh, those do not really drown her completely. So, her embodiment, her organic embodiment, is clearly more strong than that of the man's organic embodiment. And obviously, as I mentioned just a little while ago, the hookah, the very phallic object that she is consuming, makes her look, makes her appear more masculine than the biological male in this particular section. So, again, this particular slide and uh, uh, hopefully you, you, you probably have an idea what I am talking about and this is something I have been talking about to, for a great while now. So, this is something which we have, uh, you know, discussed earlier as well. The difference between biology and gender. In other words, biological identity and gendered identity. And of course, as you know by now, gendered identity is produced through performativity, it is produced through embodiment, right. So, we talked about performativity and embodiment to a great extent in the last two lectures, especially in the last lecture where we discussed two of night uh, and then of course, uh, other examples as well. Uh, now, embodiment is a process, performativity is a process through which you produce your gendered identity which may be completely different from your biological identity. So, that is the whole point, right. Your biological identity is determined by your birth from your birth, but your gendered identity can be culturally produced 
can be materially produced, can be ideologically produced, can be sartorially produced. You know, it can be produced through dresses, as Viola does in Twelfth Night. Uh, she becomes Cesario by dressing up as a man, right? So she produced her gender identity through a performance. A performative process was completely material, right? So this slide, which I just showed before you, uh, again, is a very clear example of the two different kinds of gender identities. So the male is non-masculine, whereas the female is more masculine, which is clearly shown in this particular slide. So hopefully, uh, this gives you an idea of what happens in Shatunsky Kilari. Now, uh, so again, this is a long section of, from the short story, and I'm just going to read out uh, certain sections of it. Uh, and you can read it in, in, the, in the website, the link that I just uh, showed you a little while ago, which is the link from which we are following this short story. So this particular section uh, gives you a very graphic description of the endless chess playing of the men. They just come and play chess all the time, right? And the chess playing becomes a metaphor a metaphor for non-productivity, a metaphor for indolence, a metaphor for indulgence. It's almost like a lotus eater lifestyle, where you come in the morning and you wake up in the morning, uh, take your pan box, go, go to someone's house and start playing chess and you end up playing chess for the whole day, day after day. It's like a ritual which repeats itself all the time, right? So because, you know, these are men, as I mentioned, they belong to an economic order where, which doesn't require them to work, which doesn't require them to be productive financially, economically, or otherwise. Right? So, you know, in the morning after breakfast, as is mentioned in the, in, in the description over here, both the friends would spread the chessboard, set up the pieces, and engage themselves in the tactics of chessboard warfare. In the, in the word chessboard warfare on the screen, uh, which should appear to you very, very shortly, the chessboard warfare is very, very important. So it's not really a real warfare. It's a chessboard warfare. It's a virtual warfare. So it's a virtual battlefield. So all they can think about are battle tactics on the chessboard. Right. And the chessboard becomes a metaphor for several things. It becomes a multiple metaphor for unreality, for disconnect with reality, uh, for, for self-absorption, for indulgence, and a whole host of other things. Right? So it's a chessboard uh, which really takes them away and they're completely absorbed in the chessboard. They're completely absorbed in that unreal activity. Right? And that completely compromises their hegemonic gender identity because you know, it's non-productive. Right? And all that the men do, uh, are play, they play chess, they smoke opium, they chew pan, they have different kinds of other leisurely activities. So they, in other words, it's the complete opposite. It's the ontological opposite of productive masculinity, of military masculinity, right? Which is something which is represented or embodied by the British at this point of time. The East India Company and, and Ray in the film makes it very, very clear that a British brand of masculinity which comes in, the company brand of masculinity which comes in, is very capitalist, goal-oriented, productive order of masculinity which is based on reason, logic, purposefulness, uh, and of course productivity, right? Which is the complete opposite to these two men uh, who wake up every morning and play chess and all they can think about are the battle tactics on the chess board. That's all they can think about. They can't think about, they, they, they couldn't bother less about what's happening in the real world because they don't need to, to a certain extent. So their kind of masculinity, their kind of gendered location is very, very feudal. And again, notice how something so real as economy, something so material as economy, is basically informing and influencing a certain kind of lifestyle which we can consider to be abstract. So again, this interface between abstract and materiality. Abstraction and materiality is, is, is a dialogue which runs throughout this particular short story and it's, it's an interface which we'll keep examining in this particular course, as I keep mentioning. Right, so as this description shows you, if you look at it again, so they get up in the morning, play chess, they would forget whether it was noon, afternoon or evening. Repeated messages from inside that food was ready were ignored and a cook was forced to serve food right there in the room as the two friends continued their play. Now, I want you to emphasize on the word inside over here. Repeated messages from inside that food was ready. This is a section I want you to take a look at, and of course, this is a section which I'll keep coming back as we move on in a with the short story. But this is the first example, the first instance in a short story where we look at the uh, relationship between gender and space, right? So, inside, is a space of the woman. That is why the woman is located or rather imprisoned. And what does she do in that space? She prepares food for the men. 
Now, mind you, uh, the, the slide which I played earlier, uh, the image which I played earlier, where, where we had the image of Shabana Hajbi smoking a hookah. So that image makes it very, very clear, as Ray makes it very clear in the film, that these are women who are far more intelligent than the men, who have far better administrative qualities than the men, even if only if, if only they had the real agency, but they don't have that agency, right? So they are imprisoned in the interior space, in the inside space, making food for the men, calling the men whenever the food is ready. Uh, and the men, of course, are happily ignoring those messages and they continue to play chess. So this is obviously a very decadent demography, a very decadent design of gender. The men who have the agency, political, financial, administrative agency, they're completely wasted. It's a, it's a complete culture of waste. It's a complete culture of uh, decadence, as I just mentioned. Whereas a woman who could have been much better, who could have been better administrators, better rulers, better controllers, are confined in the interior space where all they do is prepare food for the men and wait for them to come in. It's indeed a tragedy. A tragedy from a female perspective, a tragedy from a human perspective. And obviously, this kind of system, this kind of uh, culture um, is not sustainable because the men are completely unproductive uh, and unqualified uh, to be there, the helm of power. Uh, and economically, it's a decadent system as well. It's drying up economically. So the British just come in and take it over, and we have a different kind of masculinity uh, which sort of literally marches in. So if you look at the film, uh, the ending of the film, uh, which I mean, we, I'll play up still from the film, uh, hopefully, at the end, where there's a very clear, iconic image of the British army marching in, right? Marching in with the purpose of taking over, taking over the kingdom. And there is zero resistance, as I mentioned, uh, in the, in, from the side of the Nawab. So this kind of masculinity, this very feudal, hedonistic, pleasure-loving, uh, you know, self-absorbed kind of masculinity is coming to an end, as a, as a short story makes it very, very clear, and so does the film. Now, if we continue reading this passage, uh, so you know, I just mentioned uh, you know the, the relationship between gender and the inside space, and then of course uh, there were no elders in Mirza Sajad Khan's family. As a result, the game was played in his divan khana. Again, this is an, an interesting space. The, the, the divan khana in the house is a semi-public space. It's a space which is the interface between the private house and the public road. So it, it is somewhere in between. That's why I use the word interface between the public space and the private space. And hence, it's a semi-public space. So the Divan Khana is a space where the games of chess happen all the time. So this is where the two men meet. Now, mind you, the women are not allowed to enter the Divan Khana. Right? So again, look at the way in which gender and space are related to, to each other. In other words, your gendered identity embodiment, agency, performativity. So all these terms we have been talking about for the last two lectures, two and a half lectures now, uh, these are so closely and complexly dependent on space. Where you are, your situatedness, your location. So your location in a certain space determines your gendered identity, determines your performativity, determines your agency. Right? So the divan khana becomes a metaphor for the semi-public space where the games of chess take place between the two men who are completely self-absorbed and completely, you know, they're completely in denial. They, they don't they completely ignore uh, the, the woman inside. They have no idea what's happening in the world outside. So all their absorption in this semi-public space where they spend, uh, you know, enormous amount of time playing chess with one another. And again, as I keep mentioning, the entire symbol, the entire metaphor of playing chess becomes a very interesting metaphor. It's a metaphor for unproductivity. It's a metaphor for unproductive masculinity. It's a metaphor for hedonistic masculinity. It's a metaphor for a, a kind of masculinity which is decadent, right? It's not productive. It's not systematic. It's not pragmatic. It's not caring. It's something which is completely self-absorbed in its own idea of splendor. Now, coming back uh, to uh, uh, this particular description, so we have uh, members of Mirza's family who are far from pleased not to speak of the family, even the neighbors and servants made uncharitable comments. This is an inauspicious game and can ruin families. God forbid that anyone should get addicted, for it makes the person unfit to do anything. The word unfit is interesting over here because the word unfit obviously relates to uh, the masculinity crisis, the inadequate masculinity these people have. They're not really fit for anything else apart from playing chess, which is a very unreal, uh, self-absorbed, indolent activity which they indulge in all the time. 
it's a serious disease and obviously it's almost pathological because it's pathological in its uh, ignorance of reality, it's pathological in its disconnect from reality, it's pathological in its unproductivity, it's pathological in its, uh, you know, in, in a complete, uh, in a lotus eater lifestyle where we are intoxicated in a certain kind of, uh, you know, system uh, and you're completely, you know, disconnected from anything else which is more pragmatic and utilitarian. Mirza's Begum, uh, this is the first mention of the woman in the family. Mirza's Begum was so hostile to the game that she would seek out occasions to berate her husband, but she rarely got this opportunity. The game would begin when she was still asleep, and Mirza would come inside only when she had gone to sleep. However, she would expend her ire upon the servants. Are they asking for pan? Tell them to come and take it themselves. Have they no time for food? Go and throw it to them. Let them eat or cast it to the dogs. But face to face, she was helpless. She wasn't resentful against her husband so much as against his friend, Mir Sahib. She had named him Mir the Spoiled Sport. It is possible Mirza, to save his own skin, also threw all the blame on Mir Sahib. So what is immediately evident in the entire section, and the first word I would want you to focus on was, is helpless. She is helpless. Uh, she is completely agency-less. She's resentful of what is happening, as any reasonable person would be, uh, because all she sees her husband do is play chess endlessly, uh, indulge in this endless activity of playing chess with another person uh, who is equally useless and unproductive. But essentially, she is helpless. She doesn't have any real agency to change anything. Because, you know, uh, if you remember my definition of agency at the beginning of this course, agency is the ability of a self to express his or her own will with the possibility of enacting or bringing about a change. But that possibility is completely absent over here. There is no possibility of change. She cannot, uh, for the life of her, for all the resentment she has, uh, she cannot really change anything. And this is uh, something happening inside her own house, where uh, she is supposed to be the wife and you know, uh, the, 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 the half of Mirza, whatever. So forget about kingdom, forget about the political scene, forget about the public space. She cannot even have any agency inside the private space which she inhabits as the wife of Mirza. Right? So she is helpless. Now she is resentful. I mean, she, she's, and again, if you look at the description, uh, she keeps saying, this, telling the servants, that are they asking for food? Are they asking for pan? So notice the voice comes from inside. She's located inside, right? So she is someone who is imprisoned inside as a woman. So the femininity over here, the female condition in this particular short story, is indeed a tragic condition because the women are essentially imprisoned inside the interiority of the house and they have absolutely no agency whatsoever to come and commune. There's one instance in the short story where something out of the ordinary happens. Uh, she does break the protocol to a certain extent, but that's just a one-off incident. She is essentially expected right, to, and imprisoned to be inside the interior space of the house. And she has no agency whatsoever to enact any change, to come in the public, to come in a semi-public space. Forget about the public, the semi-public space. So she's resentful of her husband's activities, but she can't do anything to change it. And therein lies the helplessness of the female condition. And if you contrast that to the male condition, to the masculinity in the short story, the masculinity is obviously, as I keep mentioning, and was very, very, very graphically described to her here, is an unproductive, indolent, indulgent masculinity. And all it does is, uh, you know, getting absorbed essentially and absolutely and endlessly in this game of playing chess, which becomes a metaphor for unproductivity, which becomes a metaphor for decadence, for waste, uh, for illogic, uh, and obviously a disconnect from reality. Right. So this is where the short story really begins to become interesting, uh, and we'll continue with this lecture. Uh, we'll continue with this short story in a subsequent lecture. But as of now, uh, I just wanted you to go through what we have just said. Uh, go to the slides I have shown you, uh, and obviously, and hopefully, you'll have some idea, you know, a good idea, a robust idea about the relationship between gender, history, agency, and space. Because again, mind you, this is a kind of gender identity or gendered identities and performances which are produced out of certain historical conditions. And it's absolutely imperative that they bear the historical conditions in mind. This is a historical period between 1847 and 1856, a year before the Sepoy Rebellion. So this is the kind of decadent, feudal kind of culture which is producing this kind of gendered identities. And it's absolutely essential for us uh, looking at the short story uh, as a, you know, a text of gender studies to, to be sensitive.
to this cultural condition. So this concludes the lecture now today and we'll continue with this lecture, we'll continue with this short story in subsequent lecture. So thank you for listening and you go to the slides and hopefully we'll continue, we'll make a connection as we move on with the short story. Thank you. Thank you.